um, well, um, Gordon Carrier, our famous architect over here, agreed to come back to speak to us about San Diego uh, State University's Mission Valley project. He was here last year, he talked about uh, Carrier Johnson and his architectural background and all the great projects they've done. He said, don't talk about the community because then we had that business argument. <laughs> Nobody wanted to cooperate, so he said, okay, we'll just leave. Save the date until the election happened and did SDSU won handily and so towards Al Hopsi and confirmed with the university to uh, plan the redevelopment of the Qualcomm SDCC new stadium probably. Uh, and it's, uh, we didn't really realize we were being so happy with this because yesterday the state uh, SDSU president announced the start of uh, planning for the for the project with formal environmental reviews and public outreach periods uh, starting this month. And so it's going to be a rapid process coming up with uh, Gordon and his team to put together several plans in advance of the election last year. So he's going to remind us what all that was and talk about some of the new ideas he might have come up with since then and what he was looking forward to. So, uh, Roger retired. I see more of a ballot I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the heck he's doing, but um, well, first of all, thank you. Thanks for for the opportunity to come and speak to you um, about about this project. I mean, it was not without. Uh, let's call it significant controversy that this project proceeded through about a year's worth of uh, dialogue. And I, you know, the, the funny thing about it to me is um, probably unlike any other project I've been involved with or first been involved with, there was a passion behind the way people viewed Qualcomm Stadium. I can't see it say SP. I can't remember the letters, so it's going to be quiet. Yeah. Oh, Jack Murphy's too old to remember. Jack, yeah, I'm not. That's right. It's Jack Murphy. I can remember that easily. Um, uh, but it, I mean, unlike any other project probably I've been involved with, this had more passion behind it than, um, than any. Uh, it's a significant part of the city. I think if you took a map out through a dart, it's a good chance you could hit. Qualcomm, Jack Murphy uh, at the bullseye of the city. So it, you know, it's it's significant. It's 170 to 200 acres, depending on who's doing the calculation, what you include. Um, and we've seen it, at least in my lifetime here, we've seen it always as Jack Murphy State, this uh, beautiful piece of architecture that that uh, Frank Hope blessed us with some years ago. Uh, that I still believe is one of the most beautiful stadiums in the, the entire country. I'm going to give you a hand for that. Yeah. <laughs> I see Frank Jr. regularly in Point Roma, and uh, uh, it really is a beautiful landmark. Uh, but it's also, it's past its time. It's time for us to think about how a piece of land like that in an urbanizing community can be revisited in a way. The background, a little bit of the background of this issue is that an initiative was filed by Soccer City, which really is the only reason San Diego State showed up. There's a lot of controversy about, well, gee, why didn't the two parties get together and make something happen? And all I can say is that the parties just never were able to match each other's desires for the site. So the, the, what you're seeing today really is the result of San Diego State saying, we've got to do something because we really need this land for our campus. <clears throat> One interesting, well, I learned so much through the process because I'm, I'm but an architect and an urban designer, and so I get to hear all smart people talk about things I never thought about before. And one of the things that came up is UCSD, I guess, and somebody could probably correct me, has some, something close to 2,000 plus acres, I think, that the city at one time gave them, which was, a, a, I think, a, an immense, Visionary, uh, uh, visionary decision to make on the part of the city. We can see its impact. The city of states on, I think, 200 acres, 
and has twice the population of students. So one-tenth the land and twice the population of students, plus or minus, forgive me if my facts aren't quite, quite right. And you can see the need. Um, and, and San Diego State as a state university is one of the few universities that is seen as a research university, and that is their, that is their intention to be a research based university. Research creates jobs, research creates innovation. And we can see what UCSD has done for us in that regard. And so I stand here humbly to say it was an honor to work, to work on this. Um, so I'm going to take you through, I'm going to, I even have one of these things. <coughs> so we're going to have some fun. So, uh, so uh, I, I want to take you through this and, and talk a little bit about the, the genesis, at least of the plan that was created for for SDSU, it, it, it's, it seemed to me, um, at the very least, there, there, there needed to be a reason for us to actually participate. These are not my reasons, they're actually uh, Sally Roush, who was the interim president at the time, was working hand in hand with us. A wonderful lady, by the way, and I'm telling you, without her, I'm not sure any of this would have happened. Um, and of course, Adele De La Torre has taken the torch uh, vigorously, and, and she's moving it forward. She's a firecracker. And, somebody who really can admire and, and, and uh, appreciate here in San Diego. But there were sort of five criteria that we were given. One is that we see this as a regional asset. This is the university speaking now. So think about SDSU says, and then put these words after it. Um, this is a regional asset. Um, it needs to be a college campus environment. And I'm going to try to explain what that means, because I think many people believe it's a substitution for the academic spaces on the hill. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to be affiliated with the university's researching outlet for private industry to participate side by side. Um, that there should be no reliance on tax dollars if this project were to go forward with SDSU. Uh, it provides that expansion we talked about from that mere 200 acres to something with double its size, roughly. Uh, the site is about as I said, somewhere between 170 and 200 acres, depending on the uh, calculator uh, being used. And that the process should be transparent. One of the things that occurred with this project versus the Soccer City project, by the way, I only learned this through, through uh, listening to other people, is that the, they, when, it, when an initiative is done, this is information for all of us that I think is really important to understand. When an initiative is written, it's written within a certain number of pages of paper, right? And it's got typewritten words on it that say certain things. And if we vote the initiative in, you cannot change the initiative. Whatever is in that document and whatever those words say cannot be changed. So there was a lot of criticism of this project because it was only manifest by a 14-page initiative, the SDSU document. The Soccer City document was some 3,600 pages. <clears throat> There's no way for any of us as, as mere moral citizens to understand what 3,600 pages could say. Um, now, I'm not critical of that. I don't mean it that way. What I mean is, what I do know it said is that we can skip CEQA. We don't have to talk to you people. <laughs> you people. SDSU knew that they had to go through, that's what I mean by transparent process. We are in the midst of, and, and uh, was just referred to, uh, the Notice of Preparation, which is the Environmental Initial Study document, is about to start right now. That is a public event that allows anybody in the public to participate in a dialogue about what should happen for the campus. And there are, I, I just read the note, because I didn't know much about it myself, but there, I think there are three different sessions that you can look up, that you can attend, all of which are in the Mission Valley area that will be coming up um, associated with that project. So that, that's, to me, that was the singular biggest difference between the two. You can like, dislike the elements of it or not or whatever. There's a bunch of things that were, that were shown from conjecture that, that were, I know for a fact, not going to happen for a lot of reasons, um, all of which sound good, but uh, probably many of which couldn't happen. I will say this, the other part of what happened to us during the process is I heard a lot of dialogue about San Diego State's just gonna sit on this now that they own it for 10 years. And I can tell you exactly the opposite is the case. 
Um, I was at the uh, <clears throat> the night celebration that you know when they won, and literally two days after that, the entire team was in our office scheduling the starting of the work that needed to be done to get infrastructure in place and to have a stadium built by July of 2022 that the Aztecs can play football in against uh, Arizona, I think, University of Arizona. Um, so th this is a real deal. I know contractors are being interviewed right now for that stadium. So San Diego State said they were going to do something, and that's exactly what they are doing. I can say with absolute confidence um, going, going forward. Um, enough about that. So let's talk about, so so those were the, those were the issues that were delivered prior to uh, the issues were delivered by the president, actually, Sally Ross, to us about in, intention. And then there were two other intentions that she specifically aimed at us as a design enterprise. Number one is um, that I want you to design a college campus. Now, I'm going to go back to this comment. It's, it, the, the issue wasn't a college campus in that let's duplicate what's on the hill. Let's create a college atmosphere in terms of the way land use, scale, pedestrian interface, cars, all of that act on a new piece of property. That was my interpretation of what she said. We'll talk about that in a minute. College campus has implications. It has implications to scale. It has implications of space between things. Uh, campuses, in my, in my mind, are not about buildings, they're about the spaces between the buildings and how comfortable you feel in them. Um, and the buildings, in a way, are vessels to house faculty and events called class. But the environment on the campus is about the interface of both inside and outside uh, events. And so you need to have proper scale to make that feel comfortable, and that's a big part of it in my mind. Uh, and then the other part of this, it's kind of funny, these are labeled number one or number two, because they actually, in my mind, they got reversed in terms of the way we interpreted them. Uh, Sally also said, I want to integrate the site's natural features. Um, and many of us just think about, a, right now, a stadium in a sea of Asheville out there. It's probably the world's largest heat island. I think, I think we won. Uh, we won that concept. Uh, it's been there for a long time, right? So. Um, so anyway, uh, so uh, let the let, let begin. So we started to look, we actually started to look at the site from a historic point of view. This is the, the now these are diagrams, they're not meant to be precise in the sense of absolute uh, layout, but the concept is clear. Um, this was historic farmland. Many of you who've been here a lot longer than I have know that, that this is a valley that was basically a farming agricultural valley. Um, and this is the watershed, conceptually, that ran through the valley. And of course, you can see that's the Qualcomm site um, uh, in the middle. And then, of course, the little circle is the actual stadium. But you can see the blue lines running through it. That's, those are tributaries. Those are, those are, that's, that's water. Right? It's, it ran through the middle of the site. Um, and so one of the things that seemed to me we ought to try to do is figure out a way to to respect this watershed again um, in the conveyance of a new idea, a new plan. Um, in, the, in its time, the water had a natural flow. It was from essentially east and northeast to west, right? It was, it was all trying to find the flow line of the San Diego River, depending upon which tributary it came from, north, uh, northeast or east uh, toward the water. And the natural topography took care of that. And you can see the placement of this in the middle of it. Um, at, at the very least, probably raises a couple questions in your head about how did that happen? <laughs> right. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, and then the great, the great, uh, the great event occurred, right? <clears throat> um, and without any criticism whatsoever, I would say, look, somebody said we needed a stadium. We can bring the NFL here. We can do great things. And planning began on a piece of land that seemed relatively benign. <clears throat> in an east-west valley. Um, but the problem is, those that looked at it realized it, too, was in the midst of the watershed tributaries. And the question is, what are we going to do? And you can see what got done. Um, if you had today, literally, if you go there now, they're all grass-covered now. So it's a little less 
overt, but if you go, you can see that hillside, you can see those benches, you can see all of this. So all of this land right here was scarified, brought over to the site, and a big, what I would call, pitcher's mound was created in the middle of the site to overcome those tributaries that ran through it. Um, and then the satellite was placed on top of it called the stadium. So in essence, you had a castle. Right? The castle had a moat around it. Um, and the moat sort of looks like this. Um, <laughs> um, so since 1965 to today, this castle has sit on top of a man-made uh, pitcher's mound. I mean, it's about it's about 25 feet of fill in height, just to put it in perspective. That's about the height of this room, I'm going to say. Is that right? Yeah, probably that, right? Well, look how well it sheds water. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. The good news is in any scheme, something does go right. <laughs> Thanks for that observation. But, but what, I, what, what I want you to note most of all is this right here. Right there. Now, I, like you, have been to this stadium 122,000 times for different reasons. And not once did I think about that. Not once. And I'm ashamed to say that out loud, but when we started to look at it, what we realized is this thing has denied our greatest asset since its inception. Again, I'm not critical of what happened here in its time, but we have an opportunity to, to restore, right? To, to at least get close to restoring some measure of the value of the land brought to us before we interfered with it. And so it seemed to me there was an opportunity there. Um, the hydrology had been altered, and the river asset had been ignored. So it seemed to me if you're going to do a plan, it ought to start there. That's why when I say the two criteria, build a, build a campus was number one, and, and uh, integrate with the, the natural features of the site was number two, we decided it was better to reverse those. Let's integrate with the, the natural features first, and then let's figure out how to make a campus after we get that done, and see if we can't solve this hydrology problem. Uh, in, in the process. So the result of that is diagrammatically we started looking at just the flow line. Remember the, the original tributaries actually came in this way, came in this way, and, and came in this way. There wasn't any north-south direct north-south route. What happened at some point when this parking had to be built, this is the existing condition by the way, um, I'll talk about that in a second. All the blue is water and flood, just for, for grins. And the white is above grade. Um, and it's a diagram. It's not meant to be precise, but it's, that idea is what you saw in the last photograph. We're just trying to talk about a concept here. And what happened was uh, engineering decided that, you know, this tributary right here, if we just built a culvert down the side of the highway here, then we could let water in. And I don't know if any of you have looked at pressured water in a situation that looks like this. But pressure and tease and water don't go together. So in the in the high climate and high rain season, that's when the most pressure on the system occurs. And I'll do it this way. That diagram is about water coming down and hitting a T and then being asked somehow to find its way to the river. And that's what results. Because the water it, it's not a, water always finds a flow line based on gravity, period. Whether it's the roof in your house, or whether it's your yard, it don't care. It just finds a flow line that it can create itself. If we artificially create flow lines for it, and we don't understand that it doesn't work in straight lines, then generally speaking, it probably is not going to work very well. That's true of gutters on your roof, and it's true of your yard. It doesn't matter what it is. So it seemed to us that we'd create somehow, we had created a situation, that's right down here by the way, and that's where the T occurs. There's the river, there's the T, and the water is asked to flow down here in high season and make a right turn <laughs> and get out of there. And of course, and of course it can't, and that's really what this diagram is trying to show. So it backs up. It backs all the way up into this area. Also up here, this floods, this is the uh, Kinder Morgan um, uh, petroleum gig. It, it, it backs up and flows into here as well. So that's also a contributor uh, to, to the event. So it seemed to us 
look, if there was a way for us to try to create a flow line, realizing there has to be a development solution to the site, but if we could create a flow line that seemed to be more in tune with what the original tributary was intended to do, maybe that could be cool. And if it also helped to clean the water, and if it also helped um, to create an interesting landscape uh, for the water, that also kept development from being flooded in that high season, perhaps that was a way to look at the site. Um, and so we actually created a new tributary edge right here along the entire development. It's literally a riverbed concept that receives water and allows water to flow in more of a flow line. And I'm not trying to pretend we recreated the original tributaries, but you can't do it. That would run right through here. Um, or you couldn't do it easily. Um, so the idea was to give this some relief and allow all this land here to be floodable. But to do that, to raise the white area that you see up there, higher and leave this this other area lower almost like a dike between the two so this land in the concept uses all the grading of the site remember the pitcher's mound we grab the pitcher's mound and we spread the pitcher's mound over the site again to raise its height higher than all of this area down here to keep the two out of singular plane right so conceptually it seemed to us if we could solve that problem first then we could make sense of whatever the development should be. Forget the development, forget the buildings. Let's get the hydrology and open space right first, if we can. Because we know the plan needed to convey a bunch of community open space, both for Mission Valley and just for the community at large, which it doesn't have right now. So if we could solve that first, the building thing is always easy, frankly. Getting the open space stuff right is the tough part, usually. Um, but I think you have to start there, you can't do it later. But then it also seemed to us that if it was just as simple as this lower level and this upper level, and there was no sort of communicating capacity between the two, then it was almost something you simply looked over but you never participated in. So the idea of these arrows is to say, is there a way for us to go up and grab that land and actually use the slope between the two to our advantage somehow and integrate the two this way as opposed to setting them beside one another this way, right? Does that make sense to you? When, I don't know if I'm saying it clearly. To, to me, the, some of the, I think some of the, the issues of diagrams that we do, and I'm guilty, is we draw diagrams as if the line between two things actually means something, and generally it doesn't. What it means is that you've created some sort of false impression of the difference between what's on this side of the line and what's on that side of the line. Instead of realizing that the line should really be uh, almost a smudge, <laughs> you know, where you use a paintbrush to draw the lines as opposed to a, a number two pencil. I do use a pencil, by the way. Uh, a number two pencil with a sharp tip. Because there really are no divisions between land areas based on the lines we put on a map. Those are legal. They're they're kind of goofy in a way. And yet, we, I think in some way, we actually believe these lines exist as if to tell us what to do. So the idea would be, if we could get this lower plane, which deals with hydrology and park space, and this upper plane to live, each other, live with each other, maybe we can go up and just grab the upper level with some idea of park reach. Almost the idea of reaching into the land with uh, canyons, or fingers, we call them, essentially. The fingers can be formal, they can be informal, meaning they can be very natural or they can be somewhat man-made. But some of the water flow can actually go up into those fingers and make hydrology kind of interesting, still keeping the upper level development clear of flooding, right? So um, maybe the river can be connected to the uplands then. Instead of that diagram we saw of current Jack Murphy Stadium with that precise green line at the south end, that defines the difference between heat island and nature, right, in a way, um, as part of the process. So we, we thought, well, you know what, that could, that could be kind of cool. So the river could actually have uh, a relationship to the upland. So if we, if we thought if we could go actually dig into the development area and make these two connect somehow that feels uh, more natural, we can then develop 
buildings around that open space concept as opposed to building buildings and realizing whatever is left is, is defined as the open space. And I'll tell you, I, I'm, and I'm guilty of this, by the way. I've, this, I'm, I've been at this 44 years. I'm just now, I think, understanding that you can't do a plan getting to building yield and then step back and go, okay, what's left that we call open space, right? It, and, I, and I believe, really, if you can turn that around and say to yourself, let's get the open space right first. And if we do, there's a chance, if you, if you handle that with authenticity, meaning this is the only site in San Diego where this idea really makes any sense. It's this site, it's not 27 other sites, it's this site. Meaning, let's find what's authentic about this place and leverage it to our collective advantage for the community, for the region. Um, so the idea of finger parks came about, and what it meant was these finger parks can provide the pedestrian connection between the lower level and the upper level. Now, in fairness, flooding only happens yesterday. <laughs> I don't know. It's like this week is a prime example. But, uh, it's probably there's probably a boat out there right now. Um, but uh, but you know, the majority of the time, these two plains are completely dry. We all know that. But in rainy season, you know, you don't want something to be overwhelmed just because it's raining. But the idea of this lower plane and the upper plane connecting with finger parks means pedestrians can use those finger parks as a way to actually move to upper tier and lower tier in an interesting way and, and sort of reconnect you to the idea of the river. And, and the idea that also allows us to set the tone for a real building development if, 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 we, get it, if we get it kind of right. You know? And it's always kind of right. We never get it right. Um, but we're doing the best we can. And so that enhanced connection is, is clear. So I, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but just keep your eye on any of these parks and look at this. OK? So I'm going to go back again. See those fingers? See where the buildings are? The buildings never hit those fingers. Now, some of those fingers are formal. Some of them are informal. For example, over here, this finger is a formal uh, uh, finger. I'll explain why in a minute. This is more informal in here. This is more informal in here. But in this case, this finger actually is the heart of the residential community. And it's also the access and part of that community that allows you access to, to the park space, which all of this, all of this is, is uh, about right here. This is all public park space, which also happens to control hydrology in a tough rain, rain season. Um, um, well, I'll explain. Sorry, I'll I'll explain um, the different parts of the site briefly. But but these these are intended to uh, these are in, these diagrams are intended just to give you an idea of the the value of the, the open space. Um, talking about the building sites, the, the open space. So we had active and passive parks means both stuff that people would use to play baseball in and stuff that people would observe as um, natural biology. That's sort of the difference loosely that, that I would use to define those two things. Uh, we, we had 47 acres of that in the site. Remember this is 167 acres is the number I use typically for the, for the project. We had uh, 16 acres of community SDSU park. What SDSU said they would do is, look, we'll create, here's an example. We'll create soccer fields that the community can use, co-shared uses, right? We'll create fields that the community can use. So you're free to come and go. In fact, there's your parking right there to allow you to come and use it um, uh, to invite the general public. So it wasn't just a statement, it was an intention. Um, and they mean it. Um, uh, there was an acre because Mission Valley wanted to have the possibility of creating a, an aquatic and rec center that needed to be preserved. Uh, that acre actually sits right there, right on the edge of the park. That little kind of triangle there thing, that's an acre of land. And what it means is at some point in the future, if the community wants to build a park there, it's in a primary position, not tucked away behind 47 other things that have nothing to do with the natural terrain of the site. So it was very intentional. Um, 
community parking I talked about here. That's what this is about for, for the parks. And then maybe the biggest issue is the hike and bike trail. Because this, because there are these two levels, and they're roughly, they're anywhere from uh, 8 to 18 feet in difference of height, just to put it in perspective. Again, this is probably 22 feet in height in here, I imagine, up to the, so, so you, you know, you would have to climb a bank to get to the upper level. The idea is to use the bank to our advantage, create plateaus of activity, create bike trails that can traverse it, use the bank as an asset, amphitheaters, that's natural, right? It's a, it's a slope, you can cut amphitheater ideas in, all of which then are focused on the park. The whole idea of this plan is that everything in the plan leads to the open space, not the, not the reverse um, as a concept. So this upper red line here actually is a 20 foot wide bike trail, that, or a walk and bike trail, I call it a walk, 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 walk bike and hike uh, trail that actually organizes the entire perimeter of the site. How many times have we seen valuable sites where buildings got pushed right to the thousand percent value edge of that asset, as opposed to letting us commoners actually traverse that site while real estate still has its place? The other part of this that I've never seen, I was a responsible way back when, and it might be good or bad, Maybe I shouldn't say that. But I was on the redevelopment agency responsible for getting children's park started downtown. Um, because the, the view of it was when you create a park space, you enhance the value of every development around its edge. That's why Central Park Real Estate uh, is what it's worth today, right? Um, so that, that's true of any park space. If you can create a, an open space, development living next to it has enhanced value, right? Um, it's a little bit like the ocean, same, same idea, um, without it's wet. Um, so, so, except for radius. Uh, so that's the same concept here, but the public can still enjoy its edge in this interface between development on this side and open space on that side uh, to their advantage. And then those trails get linked to a whole series of trails at the lower level, which are the yellow lines, so it's completely integrated. So I can, I can ride, oh, by the way, this is meant to hook to the bike trails this way and that tray that way, which connect the entire Mission Valley uh, community. So it isn't about this acting as an island. It's about its, its work within its own topography, but its connection to bigger things as they occur over time. And knowing that that asset has that possibility um, as, as it grows. Um, and that amounts to about 75, I can't see, 75 acres. Um, of, of park space um, and some four miles of bike loops just inside the site, really. Um, so if you do what we call a figured ground uh, a look at, at the property, everything in green here is either meant to be open space and, you know, uh, I guess one editorial comment. I, I, one, of the, one of the things that I think make open space interesting is that we don't always think of it as a green grass field. Um, open space is about the ability to do things outside in a variety of terrains, some of which is green grass. I mean, I look at the, uh, I guess they call it the urban beach of the county down here, and I just think it's spectacular what that does for our community. It brings people to the water's edge, it invites community, it invites events. But there, there also, by the way, is the value of walking on the hardscape promenade at the water's edge. Both of those things have equal sort of importance. They're prioritized differently. But to have one site like this that's only green space between everything would be ultimately boring for all of us. So the idea is to create open space of different types, hardscape, a mixture of hard and softscape, complete softscape, natural bio, um, uh, events, uh, ability to move through all of those things, whether it be by bike or pedestrian, in our mind need to be part of, of the thought about a concept of any plan well conceived. This green happens to represent everything in the site that is either open, green, or hardscape space, and it amounts to some 89 acres of space. Remember, I told you there's 167 acres of total space. 
um, uh, on the site. Uh, that's 52% of the total site, um, as, as we understand it. And I, I think, by the way, I think that number is based on 200 acres, not my 167. So, um, I don't remember anything. Um, so this idea that open space can actually inspire the way of development occurred was the backdrop between uh, how we got where we are and, and uh, where we are today. The plan has not changed a lot uh, since it started. Our job was uh, our job and um, our job was not to create buildings. Our job was to create an idea for a master plan that could create the flexibility to live over 20 or 30 years successfully. Master planning is not about us doing building. Master plan is about creating a, a, a forecast outlook that allows great flexibility for nature, market forces, and community desires to happen over time in an organized fashion. So we know that things could change in the plan, but we also know as they change, they can change in a framework that will ultimately make as much sense as the ideas we just talked about. I'm hopeful you think makes sense um, going forward. So frequently people are concerned about the way things look. Master plans aren't about the way things look. They're about the way things are organized, and you only see the way things look as a way to begin to articulate the possibilities of the master plan uh, in three dimensions. That's that's the only purpose of imaging um, uh, anything. Really. So let me take you through the different aspects of the plan. This, the plan is divided into areas, not to keep one use away from the other, but rather just to organize the idea of the plan. This is the uh, this is the campus aspect of the plan right here. This is the existing entry road into the site. We all come in this road. There's also a road over here, you know. Uh, this is the existing road in. Remember, there's a road that comes in here from the community. Uh, that still exists. We didn't really change any of those things because we did need outlets. We need people to get in and out of here and make sense of it. So, um, so this is the campus area, we'll call it, uh, for, for the site. Um, and just as a model, the, 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 the intention of a diagram like this is to show the general size of the general size of things as they might ultimately develop. Obviously, we are going to put gray and yellow buildings on the site. Uh, uh, we could save money if we don't put the windows in, but probably not. Good. Yeah. So, yeah, but but so this is this is really intended to show the organization. So that yellow patch I just showed you is all of this right here in the site. Here is the upper plateau right here, and this is all lower plateau down here. And of course, the river uh, flow line is here. Um, and of course, uh, through all of this, a major implication is this this trolley stop, which is quite right dead nuts in the middle of the of the site, right? Which is a great asset if it's if it's handled right. And I'll talk a little bit about that here, here in a second. Um, so. Big deal, stadium, right? We, you know, the Soccer City, NFL, yada yada. Um, the the reality is, what we thought needed to be done is, we needed to find a way to meet the needs of Aztec football and sports. JD Wicker, who's an amazing AD, came from Georgia Tech. The guy is brilliant, by the way. Great guy, He's got a heart of gold. He only wants to see the stadium succeed as a revenue event center for all kinds of events to occur. So Aztec football, while Rocky, I'm sure, wants to talk about it a lot, God bless him, it, that, that isn't really the only goal for this venue. The venue wants to have Major League Soccer. So it was designed to take on Major League Soccer. The venue wants to have the possibility to take on the footprint of an NFL team should they come back to town. Um, so it does take on the footprint of an, of an NFL team. It does want to have the capacity to have events of all types, and I'll talk about why that makes sense here in a second. Um, uh, but part of the strategic issue that we had was that black circle represents Qualcomm Stadium, Jack Murphy Stadium. Right? We've got to get a new stadium built before we take the old one down, because it's the only place for them to play football. So one of the obvious reasons it isn't in the middle of the site is that right um, the other obvious reason is hydrology when you think about the site if you know anything about the 
the uh, if you drive out there sometime, I would urge all of you to drive out there sometime this weekend and just look at the site for the grade. Forget the stadium. Because we don't ever think about the grade. We just look at the stadium because it's such a big thing, right? It's a big thing in the middle of the site. Go out there and look at the bottom of the stadium all the way to the river and see the contour in that site. It's unbelievable. And honestly, until we started working on this, I hadn't even really thought about it a lot uh, until we saw some of the flooding diagrams and so forth, right? And tried to figure out how that happened. So this football stadium is set up to be 35,000 seats, multi-use, as I just described, which means it'll take professional soccer, NFL capacity. Um, uh, and by the way, just, just well, at one point, somebody had come to me and said, you've got to get that NFL thing off the, off the presentation. So why? I said, well, every time you speak to the NFL, everybody just looks at their toes, you know? <laughs> uh, because it's such a bad taste that it's left in our mouth, I guess, about the events. But the truth is, at some point, that's a real possibility. And we needed to know the land area available would house a billion and a half dollar stadium by somebody who was willing to build it. And it does. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's the that's the stadium location here. We'll talk about it. This right here, um, I think there's a note. Oh, and there's the stadium, right? So this is looking north. That's uh, uh, that's Friars Road out there. Um, this is a hotel which anchors the north end of the uh, of, of the site. And the idea of this hotel is that it would be used by the university in their hospitality management program. So they actually could use it as a teaching, let's call it an intern facility, because I'm not sure any of us want to go to a hotel that the students are running. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but it is, with a little guidance, you could go there and, uh, and be part of a program. Maybe your eggs are going to be a little late, but don't worry about it. Uh, so, uh, and this is 35,000 seats, uh, and it, it's a stadium that also, I'm working with Populous out of Kansas City on this, the guys are brilliant stadium designers, we did not design the stadium venue. Um, the stadium actually grade is right here as you approach the stadium. So all of this is 35 feet below grade. So one of the reasons it's in the upper left corner is that was the highest part of the site it allowed us to make that happen without getting into flood territory. The existing stadium, believe it or not, the field uh, is in the floodplain, the actual field. Um, remember Pitcher's Mound, stadium on top? The seats go down into that Pitcher's Mound and kind of dug the Pitcher's Mound out at some point. And so frequently when it floods in really severe rains, the field is, is wet. Um, and there have been many, many times that the elevator uh, the elevator runs in that stadium, the base of the elevator runs are filled with water. Um, yeah, think about that. So, so uh, this is great right here. We call it the 85 foot level, and this is at 55 feet or 50 feet, I can't remember which, uh, down here. So this is like the north end of the, or excuse me, south end of the stadium looking north, uh, and the Aztecs are ahead. <laughs> Just for the record, <laughs> did he maybe say that? So, um, so this is as if you were in that hotel, looking south, right? The one thing about the plan that we intended: every street ends in open space. No street ends in a building. None. So, if you're on a street and you look down the street vista, you're looking to open space, always. And the idea is that is that open space is the is the inspiration for the reason the plan is organized the way it is. And this is a prime example. That happens to be the campus mall right through it. it has a campanile in it. I guess that's the one exceptional building. It's not really a building, but 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 you you look straight into Mission Valley. There's the trolley right there. And these are obviously early sketches. But this is left open as an aperture to frame points of view of the site. So buildings are meant to be the framing of vistas always um, in the plan. And I'll, I'll try to articulate that a little better here. So you see this? You were, we were just standing there looking this way, down that avenue. So you look this way, you look this way, this way, that way leads to park, that way leads to park. All of these 
always, <clears throat> always is a strong word, always and in an open space. Meaning my invitation to be to participate with nature is what the plant is about um, at the end of the day. Um, this yellow area here is one of the shared community parks with SDSU. We're calling it tailgate because it's, a, it's capable of taking a thousand cars, uh, wild partying knuckleheads that want to you know, have a great time before the game, like me. Um, uh, but that, that's all surface parking, so it's on ground. Part of the reason for that is we saw this as a spare spot to serve a parking structure should an NFL stadium come, come in and take all of that land right there. And that's how much of the land it would take. This is the actual stadium, see right there? Outside, all of this out here is what an NFL stadium would require to be built. So all we've done is create pavilion buildings around the actual stadium seating. Uh, so that you can be inside, outside, and enjoy San Diego the way we love to enjoy San Diego as part of your entertainment venue between now and when or if ever an NFL team should return. So uh, that was the that was the uh, the idea behind that. This is the campus part of the building, probably the most misunderstood part of the entire plan. I think there, as I said earlier, there is a there is a uh, there's a thought that the that the the idea of campus is that chemistry is going to be pulled out of uh, the main campus and brought over here, either duplicated or enlarged. That's not the case. The idea is that private sector industry, meaning IDEC, meaning uh, Lilly, meaning Scripps, meaning any number of, of aluminum, um, have decided that there is an advantaged capacity in their business model to use both their research agencies and the research agencies of San Diego State's focus on research uh, discipline to combine their efforts in one place that could mutually benefit both parties. And for that, Illumina builds that building. Uh, Lilly builds the building and allows SDSU to occupy it, co-occupy it with them in the process. And, a lot, and almost all of this has to do with upper level either graduate school or PhD level researching um, uh, academic capacity being expanded in this place. Now that's not to say there aren't probably some academic issues that have duplication from the campus, but that's not really its purpose. So this million six is intended to be space that is, um, that is set up in this area right here uh, of that type of space. Again, the scale to campus, so these aren't high-rise buildings, they're three to six-story buildings. They make us feel okay if we walk beside them without being intimidated. And it's really more about the space between things. We'll talk about that in a minute. There are also 5,000 below grade parking spaces under all of this spot right here. Now, part of the reason for that is those underground spaces can act as a, as a uh, block for hydrology infill so that, so that uh, development can stay above it. There are two levels. So we're talking about 22 feet of parking below the actual building platform that becomes the campus building platform. So between here and here is some 20 feet of difference in height. Uh, that makes any sense, right? So yeah. Above the water line. Above the water line. Yeah. Well no, well, no, not the parking necessarily. The parking, the parking is actually used as a capacity to get the building occupied buildings above the water line with baffles that prevent water from getting into the garage. But at the end of the day, if some water got in the garage, it's kind of like who cares, right? So it's not, it's not like your office papers floating around. Uh, your car's in there. Yeah. It's just your car, and you're not supposed to be driving anyway. So, so it's all public-private partnerships, industry co-location, and, and the regional impact of SDSU, just to be clear, based on a study done, I think, a year and a half ago, is $5.7 billion on our, on our local economy, which is a big number, best I can tell. So this is an idea of being in the campus mall looking back toward the stadium. That's that hotel we were, we were at a while ago. This is 100 feet between things. People are coming up from the garage here, so the garage is below all of this. They're coming up from the garage to get on the mall, and they're able to go back into the entry gates to the stadium right there. That's what those little vertical guys are. 
Uh, and this is just sort of the symbolic idea of Campanile. Um, whether it looks like this or it looks like something else is not the point. The point is scale. The point is pedestrian acuity and space between things. That's what this is about. Um, um, and then this is that 20 foot wide upper level. So you can see that the tiered slope between upper level and lower level is right here. Plateaus of activity, whether they be uh, amphitheater esque or whether they're just big, large platforms for people to lay on and enjoy the scenery. There is always a connection between a street here and this open space. Here, here, no buildings at the end of them. And this runs around the entire perimeter um, of, the, of the site. Um, and then this is what we call the hub. This is what you would see if you come in the main driveway all the way to its south end. And this is, the, this is really sort of where you articulate the difference between the residential, or excuse me, the academic area over here and what would be more of the residential community on the east side of that main, what we call it Aztec Mall or Aztec Way, um, coming into the campus. Um, and then this is the residential half of the site. This is 4,600 units broken up into about 15 blocks um, for that space. They are all self-parked, meaning you never get a parking space. They are all enclosed parking uh, concepts. Um, it was our view that while we, we do have street parking in this half of the site over here, there are no cars on that half of the site except to get to a garage and go away. Um, campuses and cars are not friendly. Uh, nobody wants to have to negotiate a crosswalk with a truck. So if you can get them out of there quick and get them buried, all the better. And that was the concept over here. This is a community that has to function like a community. So it does have street parking to enhance ground floor retail experiences uh, or just uh, access of visitors or whatever the case may be. But each of the blocks also has its own containment of parking for that block's purpose. So if I have 400 residential units there, the parking for those 400 are concealed inside that block um, as a strategy. Most of this housing is about faculty and staff. It's market rate housing. Um, it's upper division graduate uh, students for the, for the campus. It also has an on-site affordable comp uh, componency. Uh, some 400, I think, uh, 50 units are dedicated to that, at least 10% of the site. And then, of course, it serves market rate. The intention is every one of these 15 blocks is developed by a private enterprise. SDSU has nothing to do with building housing on the site except to invite people in who may want to do student housing and are experts in that, but they do it as a third party and they simply lease it to students on terms that the university, generally speaking, arranges with them. And that's what they're really doing on campus now. I know they're, I don't know how many units exactly they're building, but their private development has come in and they are building student housing that will serve the campus, uh, the campus residents, uh, but the university doesn't have to take on the risk of doing that themselves. They can simply get the advantage of housing provided to their students. Uh, population as, as part of the process and so then this is the this is the residential side of the campus these are all question marks candidly those high-rises they are question marks about what the marketplace could or couldn't provide does it make sense doesn't it make sense I think it's safe to say the low-rise aspect of this maybe even without the towers is likely uh, what we will see uh, in, the, in the project. I can't predict that, but, but uh, if, if market forces say we've got to get more dense, density has been moved to the center of the site and raised. It is not at the perimeter of the site where you generally see, you go to Honolulu, right? They're all right there on the water. It's big sticks in the air. They're right on the water's edge, sort of denying the community their right to the water's edge. All that stuff has been brought internally. So scale goes from park to center of site like this. And the park, the park edges are all broken down to the lower scale edges uh, against the park, the park face. Um, and then these are some of the just some of the vistas of streets. Again, vista. This is looking south. There's the trolley line running through, but there are no buildings. You can get under that trolley line like you can now, as you get access back to the river, which we don't, we really don't do currently um, in the process. And then people ask what retail there is in retail. The other plan had 740,000 square feet of retail, the soccer city plan. There is no higher traffic generating use than retail anywhere on earth. Um, maybe with the exception of the airport. Um, 
but, but go out, yeah, that's true. So what the idea of retail here was to create retail that really served this community. Doesn't mean other people aren't invited. And it also serves game, game day event of capacities. So that's cool. So you can see that it's aligned with the stadium right here. And this becomes sort of the, the centeredness of the retail experience, which can all participate with the stadium as it wants to participate with the stadium. In off game days, this still functions as its own retail street inside this community um, on, on the site. Um, 95,000 feet of retail. There was also a request by the community that a 12,000 foot uh, grocery store like a Trader Vic's or something be incorporated. That's exactly what that is. They were thrilled, and we are too, because I think it's a good thing. And 12,000 feet at this scale is about right. It feels 48,000 feet isn't right. And 740,000 feet really ain't right. So the question about you know, getting the scale of uses in the right sort of genre of density uh, was, a, was a big part of the debate along the way. This uh, hotel aspect sits up here. This is a uh, limited service hotel site, maybe a, a one of the Hampton Suites or any number of things like that could serve the site. This is actually a convention capacity hotel. I don't mean convention like convention center, but, but a hotel that has meeting space <laughs> emphasis. And the, the good news about this, this is all open space out here. The, the only built part of this stadium is this oval right here, which represents the seating rack, right? But beneath the seating rack and all the space between here and here, all the way around, all that kind of light white area, you see all the little da, 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 all of those are little pavilion buildings, which are open space. They're open to the, to the sky. And all of this space up here can be used by that hotel as an indoor outdoor capacity expansion for whatever the hotel convention capacities might want to uh, might want to do along the way and again that's about uh, being able to, to use the hospitality management uh, program at the university as part of the part of the deal and that's that's the hotel gig there uh, the other part of this hotel it is a dense project this is 24 story the idea was to try to anchor the stadium which is a little bit awkward a stadium is kind of there is the stadium. First of all, stadium is mostly about us getting to it, looking inside, right? We don't, we don't. So this is the reverse of that: get to the stadium, but provide reasons to look out. Um, the hotel is a way to anchor that end vista to the north, um, and also create emphasis of that access to the south, which again, is back to the park space, uh, intended to be back to the park space. Um, so I know I'm out of time. I'll shut up. Um, we wanted to engage the river. We wanted to address hydrology. We wanted great parks and open spaces that serve community, SDSU, and the general public. This is a regional asset. It really isn't about San Diego State so much to provide some of their goods, but it's really about us being able to go to the site, feel good about what's offered. Um, support the Mission Valley Community Plan um, and provide growth uh, to the university along the way. Um, these are interesting uh, uh, facts that I think, and I'll leave you with this. 61% of the alumni at SDSU still live in our county. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, uh, they provide a lot of jobs, their impact, you see uh, the taxes, and they've been here 120 years, not going anywhere, I don't think. And so this site now, because of your confidence in San Diego State, has the ability to spend another 120 years both training our children and our grandchildren, uh, creating intellect, research, and possibilities of business we wouldn't have seen otherwise, which are all about economic, about economic future. Um, and it's all because you all did the right thing, in, in my mind. Uh, you thought about our region, you thought about legacy, not transaction, which is what I saw the difference between these two uh, proposals being. You can do a transaction anywhere, creating legacy is a little tougher duty. Um, so congrats to you, and thanks for letting me Oh, no question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this gentleman had a chance of person. Sorry. Yeah, pers personally, I'm not in favor of development by initiative, which is what this was. God bless you. But the other thing is that 
certainly is part of addressing, being addressed in CEQA is the noise pollution associated with concerts and other events, venues reflecting off going into that residential area, which is a concern right now, and uh, the whole traffic aspect of funneling that many people into an event center at any one particular time, and how that affects the entire area. No. Just, just comments on. And actually, and I'm sure that it's part of the whole that process. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me. I'm going to take you to this. This is one of the things that we did because we had to, we, we were being pummeled on TV with advertisements that I mean I, they're sort of embarrassing to me because they're trying to make the university of 120 years of age look stupid. I, I just don't. That, that doesn't, it doesn't set right, and so at some point you kind of have to protect yourself, right? We kept hearing about traffic. I told you about retail. You ain't seen traffic like you'd see if 740,000 feet of retail got put on it. And that, that's the analysis oh, yeah. right there. Their number actually, truthfully, by Sandag was 88,000 traffic trips, not 62. I don't even know where this came from. Um, and our plan, in fairness, was 55. It wasn't 40. So the difference between the two plans is obvious. That doesn't, that does not remove, however, your concern uh, about traffic that relates to everyday development. And we, through the CEQA process, are going to have to figure out how to mitigate those issues, including improvements that need to be made. As to the noise, a couple things occurred to me. There wasn't going to be any more or less noise with this plan or the other plan. The second issue is we intentionally put the stadium in the ground, 35 feet, to obliterate some of the noise that would come from an open air stadium that was completely open to the air. And that hotel on the north side is also a sound baffle, believe it or not. So now, does that eliminate all your concerns? Absolutely not. But nobody on earth believes that you can do new development that doesn't create impact. It doesn't happen. I mean, I know we want to believe that. But what we can do is we can figure out ways to do the best we can to mitigate within those impacts. But saying no, and I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying, saying no isn't an answer to the future of our city, particularly with 180 acres of land that is uh, fraught with opportunity for our region. So. Ron, thank you for the uh, and excessive concern about the vehicle. I'm really impressed by the thought that Spawn is to integrate the campus with nature and the community. And there are a couple of uh, things that you've done here that I think are impressive in terms of just planning in general and seeing any other. tells us before they talk to us about <coughs> buildings that they tell us what their concept for the public realm is. Now here's the irony of that as a designer there is no greater opportunity to figure out what to do with buildings than after you've figured out how to make public space successful. Because public space is about scale. So it tells you where buildings should really be right in a way but if you start in reverse and again in my early career I did a lot of this where I didn't I kind of didn't get it um, uh, 
if you're if you're if your intention is to you can't wait to show somebody what the buildings look like, you're probably lost as a designer. Because there's no you can't back into open space after you've made physical commitments to vertical structures. You can't do it, it doesn't work. Now you might get lucky, but probably not. And I, I know in my career I've done stuff that I'm I don't feel good about because it was like, dude, you just completely missed it. And you know, with a lot of years you, you begin to realize, look, if we could solve and that dialogue, by the way, me coming to you and having a dialogue about public space is a dialogue you can't wait to have. Right. I mean in most in most cases, and people are very constructive when they realize you're gonna take that seriously. That only helps me as a designer because it means I can have a dialogue that's a meaningful, honest, intellectual dialogue with people who care about what people experience every day. Then from that, I have an armature around which development can occur, which is way more interesting because the open space creates uniqueness that will complement the unique nature of the building that will go on around it. That's what this really is about. Without the idea of open space and trying to address hydrology, this is just, this would be sort of just a random site plan anywhere in USA. And, I, and I'm a believer that if you do a site that's, that's steeped in concept about open space or some other authentic, integral idea of thinking, you cannot transfer it to another site. It will never work someplace else. That's what we should be asking our designers to give us. You should be forcing me to tell me what my concept is that's unique to that site. And if I can't do it, run me out of the room. Oops, well, it's site. <laughs> uh, I noticed that the picture here kind of looks uh, like the river of Wall Mall. Or it could be maybe uh, canoeing and fishing and stuff like that. I was wondering if there's any consideration for that kind of thing. I was also wondering if you had the, uh, the slide comparing the this picture to the soccer city. Plan? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got one of them. Let me bring her up for you. All right, remember that. Well, what I want you to remember about this is the organization of it. Forget the buildings. You can like or hate the way they look. I don't care. That's not really important. Look at the scale. Look at the organization and look at the relationship to open space. That's all I'm asking you to do. Oh, Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't need to, right? We, we, you guys are all smart people. It's not, and by the way, I don't think anybody here intended to do anything bad. But in my mind, this is the difference between beginning with a conceptual idea in mind and beginning with buildings in mind. Um, and the buildings are beautiful. I'm sure they're beautiful, right? Not, that's not really the point. Making beautiful buildings is easy, though. That's not, the, that's not that hard. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, you see that? I'll repeat it so they can hear it. Their plan was about making money, though. It was about the yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what their intent was. I, I can't project that. I, I, I do know this to me appears to be, and I said it earlier, I, I think I think the major difference between the two and well look, we have the we have the luxury of working with the university was, was that you know their their heart was inside of what needed to happen and they saw what they were going to do as legacy for region. And I see this plan more as transaction. Are either of those bad? Not necessarily. But I believe legacy has sort of longer flavor to the region uh, than transaction money. That's all. So I don't judge it so much as it's uh, different. Please. Years ago, there was talk about the flu of fuel from the, from the storage tanks. Yeah. Still, um, that's how all the fire pits are going to be lit. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'm just obviously kidding. Relax. <laughs> um, yeah, there was there the Kinder Morgan, 
is the is the gig up there, and uh, the responsibility for all of that cleanup uh, is being handled by them and the city, with responsibility to make the cleanup through EPA cert certified land tests. What I will tell you is that none of these, none of the residential sites dig into the earth. They're all built upon fill which we created, which raises us above that hazard should it exist even after an EPA certification. Does that make sense to you? So, so we didn't see any value in trying to go in and negotiate bad soil on behalf of a residential community. We thought, look, we're building fill uh, that we know is going to be engineered fill that we can actually live on top of, for lack of a better term. It doesn't really live on top because it'll be in pylons. Think of, a, think of a, a, a wharf. That's the way these residential buildings are built. And think of the, the, the actual platform of the roof or the, the, the wharf being where the building goes. So there's sticks that are going to the ground, right? They're all concrete and this and that. They're going down to bedrock to secure it. So it basically ignores that layer of soil and builds the building above it. Mr. Wood. Gordon, you talked about changing the, the flow of the river at the border from a north and south flow to where it joins the east west flow. When I'm looking at this line, I see the east west flow, but I don't see the river cutting the corner. Well, it's probably an issue of diagram, but the river tributary we created is right at the edge of this toe, right there. It runs all the way along there, yeah. all the way along there, and then finds its way back into the river right there. So that'll be like a little creek. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be a dry creek most of the time down, but right. as you know, when it gets wet. Please. Well, the other question I got on your residential stuff. Uh huh. Um, you've got all your retail put over in the university research center. <coughs> all those people living in those residential are going to need cleaners, going to need grocery store on the corner. So it seems to be like you should put some retail in there as well. Uh, there may be spotted retail down throughout, but let me just show you. It actually is in a residential district. Uh, it's half in and half out. That's all residents right there. Right there is all residential. So it's on the interface between what would be uh, campus, which is on this side of this vertical line, and I guess it's Chase, right? So that's that's the entry road. This side is university. That side is residential. But to your point, I mean, we we actually looked at you know maybe housing some spot retail around trolley center. I think a lot of that. And by the way, I, I would see retailing happening right in here, in here, yes. in in this in this finger park, right. I think you're right. I think I, market will tell us that, and and I think it will evolve, you know, over time. Mostly ground floor stuff. You don't want it up, but yeah, good observation. I agree, completely agree. And I think what we're seeing though is that, hey, we we know we need to have at least this much. If you think market forces allow other things to happen. And I'm not speaking for the university, but I suspect the university would say that makes sense to us. Yeah, that's a good observation. Please. Yes, I have questions about uh, the once CEQA is finished, uh -huh. and then as the master planner and your team as the master planner, once it goes to the other disciplines, like the architect for the stadium, the retail area, right. the university, once all of these people get started, is there a is there a process or some sort of I guess filter for the decision makers of the university needing X amount more parking or the retail area X amount more parking and I guess those decisions and those discussions going up to the master planner. I guess once you pass the torch to these other disciplines and other designers, right. when they come into conflict with each other, how is that going to be resolved? Well, uh, first of all, secret, secret, secret defines a lot of that. In other words, if you bust through the secret requirements that you got approved, you're going to be back in secret. So, so 
the, the idea that CEQA anticipates what needs to happen in density and use and, and those kinds of things is paramount. Um, the other part of this is this is a company with design guidelines that allow people to understand you can do this, but you can't do that. Um, so don't don't try to put a 12-story building in the middle of that campus because it's, it's not allowed and it wasn't approved under CEQA. We, we have to show envelope size, mass, and density as part of our CEQA approval. So that's why I say it's less about the way things look, although the design guidelines will begin to address some of those things too. It's more about quantity. It's more about the things, as you might suspect, that impact environment in some ways. Now, I guess some of us could say the look of a building impacts the environment too, but, but I think most of the issues are about density, air quality, uh, traffic, uh, parking, etc. So they're overseeing that as, with this guideline again. They meet with the university. I guess my question was, as the as the focal point of this design is the open space. Right. When the stadium comes in and the city says, "How are you going to park thirty five thousand people? Park all these details. Are you going to park? Are we going to run into a situation where all of this open space starts getting carved out?" At no, the, park, the parking numbers have been a company. Parking numbers for the stadium were derived by popular the stadium designers. So they told us how many spaces they need. We have, believe it or not, the number is about 7,000 spaces for 35,000 seats. A lot of that has to do with the trolley's capacity, um, uh, and a lot of it has to do with the change in transportation related things like Lyft and Uber and other things. People aren't driving places. So those numbers were actually given to us by somebody who does this regularly uh, throughout the world. So we don't see, well, in the early phases, we see a lot of parking just on the surface because there's going to be a lot of land once the pads are created. Um, but the vessels for parking include, include uh, that 1,000 cars, that 5,000 cars, because remember, when an event happens, uh, you're, not, you're not in class. And then I think there's another 600 uh, parking spaces or something, or a thousand parking spaces related just to surface street parking inside the residential community, and then the other vehicles, meaning trolley, Uber, Lyft, etc. So that's it's been anticipated. Um, there's kind of two parallel processes going on here. Um, the university now is starting on a CEQA process to receive. Uh, confirmation that it's designed and, and planned is going to be good. Meanwhile, the city still owns the land. Correct. Right. And at some point, there's the issue of the city selling the land to the university. Correct. Right. What? How do those two parallel work? Which comes first and which comes second? Well, they're they're on fast track, uh, on on parallel paths right now. Uh, the the the. I can't say the details because I don't know the details, but I know that John Kratzer with GMI, uh, uh, Del De La Torre is president, uh, and other folks related to San Diego State are in regular negotiation with the mayor's office related to the transaction required to gain possession of the site uh, uh, under a sale. Simultaneous with that because of timeline, and you could call it at risk because it, I guess Formally, it is at risk, although the initiative says city will sell property to San Diego State. I don't, I'm not an attorney, so I don't know what that means. Um, but uh, simultaneous with that, because of the timeline and the intention that something get done now, not 10 years from now, uh, the team is forwarding all the efforts to relate to get to that, getting that stadium done ASAP. As I said, July or June, June or July of 22, is when it's intended to be done. So everything is moving forward on the, de on the design and build side as if that transaction will occur, and it's expected to occur sometime in the fall, I think, of this year is when they finally think they will uh, make that transaction final. Thank the you. terms of it are where we're at, so I don't actually know the close. Or any of that. Jack? The uh, 75 acres for the park land. Yeah. What's the constitutional part that you need to issue ballots for ages? The link down side is a lot of your chart shows covering a lot of property taxes in the city. My friends that park the right are growing because they don't see enough revenue to support the maintenance of the park. How do we get the maintenance of the park? 
Uh, my understanding is SDSU is taking on the responsibility of doing that, but I can't guarantee that, Jack. It's not my area of expertise, to be honest. I, I don't want to overspeak, but that was my understanding is first of all, San Diego State was going to improve the park uh, and that they, they had some role, if not the entire role, of maintaining it, but I actually don't know the answer to that. So I don't want to speak. Please. Has any thought in the design of uh, the uh, uh, state been given to connecting people to the airport? Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. You don't know the airport down just uh, above. <coughs> oh, here. Oh, down here. Oh, across here. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Roger can explain that to you. I don't even need to explain that. <laughs> you want to explain it, Roger? <laughs> so, there, so there has been years a bridge that's, in fact, it's, I think it's been designed uh, that connects these two across this riverbed. Somebody asked me a question earlier that I'll come back to about the sort of. There is a road, but it's way further. Yes. I know, but the, the point is, there is a there is an idea, and I don't exactly know where it is, but we were just told to forget about it, it's never going to happen. Um, <laughs> and I take those things seriously. Uh, there was supposed to be a bridge connection that got you across the river to, co to connect that which was north to that which is south, which seemed particularly logical to me. But for reasons that I'm not able to explain, I think some of which is, we don't want you to drive pylons into the riverbed because it will disturb the habitat, it's not going to happen. So the answer to your question is, it has been anticipated, it has been talked about, but I'm told has been denied thus far. You know, time will tell. Right? Good question, though. Please. Um, I have two questions, and one of them is one word answer. Um, no. There... Oh. <laughs> no. No. I was guessing. I was guessing. Are <laughs> there... I worked in Grantville in 1977 and have been watching a sandbar in Grantville mm -hmm. since 1977 that was started out as nothing and now it's huge. Uh, is the river going to be cleaned out uh, beyond just the place where you're talking about? I have to use two words. I don't know. I have three words. <laughs> Good answer. I, I don't know. I, okay. I, I don't know. Outside of the side, I'm not sure. Second, this will take more words. Okay. Um, are you planning and how are you planning? to connect this area with the campus on the hill for people to go back and forth? Well, the, the obvious connection, obviously, is the trolley. Um, and I think what, I, I mean, I, my hope is what will happen is the, the number of cars assigned to that route would be enhanced because it has the capacity to do that. So that the time interval has more, is more gracious, perhaps, right? Um, but the other thing I want to emphasize, that there, it's, it's sort of a different, it's really sort of a different set of people, meaning that if I'm taking 101 science, whatever it is, chemistry, I'm probably not on this campus taking it. Uh, I might come to the football game, uh, which means I'm going to get on the trolley and come because I'm near the main campus. But I'm not, I'm not taking a 10 o'clock class at the main campus and a 12 o'clock class here. They're not the same. They're not intended to be. I, I, again, I'm just telling you what I was told, so I'm not. I'm far from an academic, so. Uh, uh, but when we'll, yeah, it, it, well, you get on the trolley and go, yeah, 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 yeah. I think. We won't let them drive. <laughs> so you brought up the idea of with the residential area that there's going to be on-street parking, and that the building itself is going to facilitate the parking for the actual residents. Does that mean the third party company is going to end up doing underground parking for the specific building that they designed on the site? Yeah, there, it's, it's not underground, it's, it's above ground, and it's encapsulated, it's encapsulated by living units, which means you're not going to look at an ugly parking garage. Um, but the answer is no developer that we've ever dealt with, and a lot of the stuff you see around you downtown, we've done the high rise stuff. Uh, no developer that we know of will ever build a residential building that doesn't contain its own parking requirements within its own site. Now, that may change because the city right now is talking about eliminating parking requirements, et cetera. I don't know, I don't know how that will affect more suburban communities, which is what I would call this, rather than an urban-centered 
central business district community. Um, um, but I do suspect that parking ratios will be reduced even, even if they're not eliminated up there. So for example, in projects that we do, it wouldn't be unusual for us to build somewhere between 1.1 and 1.4 parking spaces per unit in a project. And those get you know assigned to one, two, and three bedroom blah blah blahs right across the thing. Um, uh, that ratio could go to 0.75 per unit, for example, maybe. Yeah. But it, in all of that, by the way, unfortunately, in the private development industry, all of that's driven by your bank, believe it or not. It isn't driven necessarily by the desires of the development. It isn't driven by the community desires. It's driven by a banker who's being asked to lend money to a project, and here, here, her question first is, well, how many parking spaces do you need? Because the industry has always told me you need X, which is always out of sync with the industry, by the way. But it's always very conservative, and so what happens is a lot of the stuff gets driven by financial markets, not by need, not by community desire, or not by even the developer desire. So, the answer, short answer is there will be parking that is for each of the projects contained in that design on the site on which the project's being done. I don't know the number. The market will probably tell. Please. Hey, Gordon, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you. You too. A uh, quick question on the stadium. You had mentioned that uh, populace is looking at it such that if the NFL, NFL team were to come in, there would be some ability to either go to new stadium or expand the existing. Is right. that correct? Right. Can you give us any information regarding what that looks like? How do you how do you plan for a future uh, expansion of such a robust structure? Well, well, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'll I'll take a leap of faith and say. It's very likely. First of all, the stadium that's being done for San Diego State uh, will be a uh, a nice but modest stadium. Meaning, it will not. I don't think it will be a stadium that has sort of the robust concrete attitude that that Jack Murphy Stadium presents to us every day. Uh, think of it a little bit more like a beautiful erector set, right? I mean, lighter, a lighter version. So I said that 30, uh, uh, there's 30 feet of, 30 or 35 feet uh, below grade. So all of those seats are concrete built into earth, right? So those are all kind of below grade as you approach the stadium. The balance of the seating bowl above you is going to be what I would call a seating light, meaning it'll have a much lighter feel about it, a much more, uh, let's call it steel versus concrete feel about it. The reason I say that is I suspect if NFL comes in that they'll say, you know what, we're knocking those seats down and we're going to start from that concourse level and go up with what we need, leaving, leaving the seating bowl in place. I suspect, logically, it would tell me from a design point of view that's what you do. I don't know that and uh, for sure, but I do know that this space, I'm going to try not to trip it. This space right here, right there, is the size necessary to house the footprint of an NFL venue, right? And we left this as a space where a parking structure could be built um, that helps complement the parking for the additional seat capacity that might occur. I, I don't know if that fully answers, but it's about as close as I can get. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> Please, right um, I wanted to look ahead 100 years and say whether the university is missing the boat on the mm. fact that a lot more density will be needed in the center of the part of San Diego County. And it seems like 4,600 units is half of could be built there. And I wonder whether the sequence master plan will allow in the next generation. <coughs> Rethink that and add a lot more development on this site because we made plenty of mistakes in under, under building in downtown and Mission Valley and now the Crawley Line and, and Liberty Station. All these places have been modestly developed when, when there are housing shortages today, projecting in the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. This may be another under underdeveloped site. So, what do you think is the long term? Capability to rethink this in 
Well, I mean, I, I think we can think of any city, let's just call it the United States, any city in the United States and look 100 years forward and go, we're going to knock all this stuff down. Start over. But 100 years is a long time. The, the building, the, the average building, at least by code and by at least our experience, average building term of, of, or length of, of uh, half life is maybe 75 years for academic building. That's kind of the number that that makes sense. And for commercial buildings, it might be 45. So, Roger, I I, I suspect you know, I know I'm I got the same crystal ball you've got. Only mine's a little dimmer, probably. Um, I suspect that it would be people looking at the site in 60 years from now going, you know what? We need to knock that 10 blocks down and start over. You know, I, I, I suspect. Uh, I, I, I don't know. There's a gentleman in the back in Green Bay. I don't, I don't want to miss Green Bay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, is there any talks, I mean, with this idea of increased ridership, is there any talks with SDSU and MTS to for SDSU to give back to MTS to help create this extra, the extra trains, the extra uh, capacity needed uh, to, to transport people from SDSU to this site? Give back meaning, I'm sorry, give like, back. Uh, just, you know, help finance, finance, or, help finance the, yeah. the buying of new trains or I, you know what, I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm over my skis. I don't, I don't, I don't I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I just, I don't want to speak on their behalf. I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I just don't know. John. Uh, did you identify any afterbirth quite fall under the side? No. No. There was a question back over here. What I'll give to Steve. Well, I was going to respond to Roger's comment. Oh, yeah. If you want to Good. crack this egg open, you're going to have to go back to the voters. This is a voter initiative. We're bound by that. That's the Ten Commandments for this site. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you get with ballot box planning. Good point. Good, good in that. Um, I would just look to the left, though, and look at the IKEA, Costco, those sites as being a much greater potential for the future of the ballot. Um, yes, you know, I think this creates a great, though, synergy to start that. You know, this, this is, again, I, that's great uh, comments, Steve, the one I hadn't actually thought of too much. I mean, I think the difference, Roger has pointed out, we're not, I'm not sure the initiative actually spells out how many units are here. I mean, it just says we're going to do X, Y, and Z yet, but it's relatively broad. I, I don't think it does. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the bigger issue for all of us, I think, is just, I mean, I'm Joe Citizen. Is that this whole initiative nonsense has got to stop? Um, you can't. It's it's no different in my mind. Mike Stepner can speak to this probably better than I can. But there, it's no mystery to me that every time we try to legislate design thinking, that something goes haywire. I mean, there's a reason. First of all, I think it eliminates idiosyncrasy, which is just design's best friend, not its enemy. This idea that you could see an exception someplace in what is the commonality of things that happen because things got so overplanned and so over legislated that freedom to express and create beautiful things is actually potentially limited in the process ain't a good thing. And these initiatives are sort of the same way, except there's stuff buried in 3,600 pages that none of us will ever understand or be able to control, and yet. If it's voted in, we have to live with it. The difference is active civic involvement with making real land use decisions happen every day right here in this room. And that means telling our leadership in elected office, you were elected to lead us, not to watch an initiative that somebody outside of your purview has put together and we have to deal with. I just do not believe that's how design will ever happen. <laughs> and I'm also not running for office. <laughs> <laughs> Please. 
Um, as others have said, the, the incorporation of the river in the open space is very thoughtful and, and really well done. And all the diagrams that, that you showed are essentially from the riverside. Other than the folks who are going to be living and working here, the experience of thousands of San Diegans living <coughs> in Friars Road. What is the experience from the Friars Road side? Is there any view through the property to the river? Um, and and you know, but for the hotel, could one see through the stadium and down that promenade? Mm -hmm. And what is shown here as a soccer field that is also the tailgate park and a potential mm -hmm. parking structure. Mm -hmm. oh, is that is that part of a potential use for it? Yeah, I think the two things. The, the tailgate park is there specifically to mitigate the scale of the stadium against its surrounding community, to be honest with you. I, look, I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I'm not. Uh, we didn't plan this as if Santa Fe was coming back. We planned it because we were told we need to leave room for the NFL to come back. My view is the plan that's done should have complement um, to the community now. So. The choice was for us to take, oh man, I'm better. The choice was to take that and move it over here because what it does is it actually frees up land. And the, the idea was, no, let's leave this here because that space between a built structure and the community for two reasons, for noise reasons and for scale reasons, we thought it was a better fit with the surrounding community. Now on game day, in fairness, there are gonna be cars in there and you know, of people drinking past Blue Ribbon beer, but but that's but that's an event. That's not life. The other part of that is this field is of use to all of these people. The third thing you reference. This is all. Remember, we scarified this hill to get the dirt to put the stadium on. All that is upland property. It's all higher. So you're going to look over this property, with the exception of the hotel, by the way. To your point. You're going to look over the property and have vistas to the valley that I think are actually quite ex uh, exquisite. And because this stadium is half in the ground, it's also intended to be as low as it can be. It's much lower than Jack Murphy Stadium. Probably half of the height you're going to see above grade. Now it also has a lot less seating, which means it's also smaller, right? So it's a very good question. There are, everything is lower scale. Uh, three to six story. It's not you're not you're not we're not trying to build with except the hotel. Uh, we're not trying to build things that are huge, but the the, the community really is upland uh, anyway, as 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 noticed by that scarified land that gets the dirt for the Jack Murphy State. That's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> several months and spending so much time talking to one of our crowds today. So we thank you so much. Thank you. And we give you a book that you have been named for inspiration about Carol. 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 Carol.